This is my third uh, installment of the Faith That Won't Quit series, my last time to speak with you. I enjoyed uh, being here two weeks ago. We talked about from Hebrews 11, one faith is being sure and assurance and surety and all of the guarantee and all of the promises of God, the power of God is sure. And last week we talked about faith is spoken and it's and we, we hear a word, we speak a word, and then we hold fast to that word. And today I want to read from Hebrews 11, 1. For those of you maybe haven't been in any of the series, I've been reading in Hebrews 11 and teaching out of that. It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. So it's a, it's a certainty. It's, there's no doubt about it. And it is certain, or a conviction, you, you know that you know that you know, it's certain of what we do not see. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the word of the Lord. There are people in here today that are really walking by faith and not by sight. They haven't seen the miracle they need, or they've had a tough, tough time, and they're just wondering, Lord, why can't they see what they believe for? And they're walking by faith and not by sight. And we pray an encouragement upon them today as we study the three heroes of faith that we'll talk about. Would you bless them, Lord, as they enter a new year? Would you bless them with hope and a new day? And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, you know, one of my favorite things to do, guys, is fish. And I love it. I don't get to go fishing very often, but... Uh, my son is here today, and he's a he's a fishing whiz. He wasn't with us on this trip, but one of my other sons, we we got up uh, early on Monday this week, and we went down to Hopedale. And I hate to say this is sacrilegious, maybe, but we murdered the redfish and the bass. We murdered them. I mean, we got uh, I think twenty five fish we brought home, and we fed everybody. And oh, we just had a, we had redfish on the half shell. Come on, do you feel the anointing? And I just love, I love the marsh. I love it. But what I really don't like that much is getting up sometime we leave at 3.30. So I get up at 2.30 in the morning. I mean, I didn't think God was even awake at 2.30 in the morning. And it's dark and you get out, get out there in that truck and you got to drive a couple of hours down there to the coast and, and all. But I just was thinking about it t- today about faith. And that when you get up and you go somewhere early, man, it ain't light yet. It's still dark. It still looks, uh, you know, hopeless. And, 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 and if you didn't know what time it was, you just think, man, I'm, uh, it's time to go to bed. But actually, a new day has already begun at midnight. And I talked to someone this week. They were telling me about an illustration a minister used about it's a new day actually at 12.01 a.m. Well, it sure don't look like a new day. In fact, you got one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock when I'm up leaving to go fishing. It don't look like a new day at all, but it's already three hours old and then four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. And when there's no daylight savings time, 7 a.m., here comes the light and the sun. And what that says to me is it could already be a new day and you hadn't even seen it yet. Clap your hands a little bit and get excited with me. It could already be your new day. And I've just, one of our brothers here is walking through a real difficult time. And I just was sharing with him just a moment ago. I said, this message is for you because it's already a new day. And here's the point of the end of that verse. Faith is being sure. We already dealt with that of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. One translation says it confirms What cannot be confirmed by your senses. Faith confirms or is convicted of what you cannot see or confirm with your senses. Now that's the problem with faith is we can't see the thing. Somebody said, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. Well, actually faith is a choice because when you see it, you don't need to believe it. You already got it. So faith, believe it or not, is, is only there when you don't see it yet. It is a new day. It's still dark. But what I've seen about faith is that I'm going to have to operate for six or seven hours in the dark before I see the light and the manifestation of what I was believing for. 
And I don't know if you're in the dark right now. How many of you are actually believing for something and it's pitch black outside? You don't see anything yet. Come on, raise up your hand. Financially, maritally, vocationally. So this third installment of our Faith That Won't Quit series is going to be about demonstrating your faith in the darkness. Yes, I believe last week was an action we take, speaking it, speaking it, speaking it out of our mouth, holding fast to it. But there just comes some time where you hadn't seen any change, any difference. The new day has already dawned, but you don't see any difference. You know, uh, I love what Smith Wigglesworth, I understand he raised a number of people from the dead. He lived back in the 1930s, 1940s. Lester Summerall, a friend of mine, knew him well, traveled with him was in his meetings and told me about a lot of his miracles that he did. But he said that faith, Smith Wigglesworth would just walk up and down in a room saying four words. Faith is an act. Faith is an act. Faith is an act. And he'd say it hundreds and hundreds of times. And I've thought about that so often. Come on, say that out loud. Say it. Faith. Say it one more time. Faith is an act. It's not just a feeling. And we get this wrong. We think, do I feel like I have faith? Let me tell you, your feelings will mislead you every time. Faith is an act. And that's what the title, I'm titling this message today, Faith is an Act. I love James chapter, 20, chapter 2 and verse 18. And I'm reading this out of the Good News Translation. Let me put that up on the screen, guys. Here we go. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without, what's that next word? Actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. And how was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar, can't you see? His faith, look at this last verse, his faith and his actions work together. And his faith was made perfect through his actions. Over and over and over, that verse uses the word faith and action together. When Abraham got up with his son and took him to offer him, man, it was midnight. It was a new day, but it was dark. And he obeyed. He obeyed. So what am I saying? That faith is actually something that you demonstrate that you're seeing something different. It hasn't come yet, but you see it clearly and you're going to act like that thing exists already. Now we're talking. Faith is, this sub is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot yet See, now let me just make a qualifier here because some people think that just they can do any action and it demonstrates faith. But there are inappropriate actions that you might take that people, th I've had people say, well, hey, I'm going to be healed. I'm just going to stop taking my medicine and I'm going to be healed. I said, well, you know, if that's what you need to do to be healed, everybody in the world could do that. That is not, don't do anything life-threatening when you're saying I'm taking an action. Come on, say Amen. In fact, start off with getting the common cold healed in your body before you jump on or off to raising the dead. I mean, people, it says we grow from faith to faith. So don't do ever do anything life-threatening with yourself saying, I'm going to take this action and hear me carefully because I've been pasteurizing a long time. <laughs> so today, I'm going to give you three actions that demonstrate faith. And I really could teach that whole chapter because it's nothing but the name of a person and an action verb after it. By faith, Noah, it says, built an ark. The man had never seen rain. It had never rained before. And yet God said, I'm going to flood the earth. It's going to rain and I'm going to flood the earth. Well, see, he obeyed. He acted on something that he could not see. And he built that ark. And they got up in it. It hadn't started raining. God closed the door. And then the rain began to fall. The fountains of the earth broke up. So demonstrating faith is really critical. And let me give you these three faith actions. I do them every day. I try to walk in these. 
And this is how you do faith on a daily, daily basis. I know you need faith for a miracle every now and then, but now I'm just talking about the just shall live by faith. You act by faith. You demonstrate by faith. The first one is able. And if you're in Hebrews 11 with me, it says in verse 4, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting, notice that, accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now that's Hebrews 11.4 and it's telling us that by faith Abel offered. Isn't it interesting that the very first statement about acting your faith has to do with offering your faith. And this in the book of Genesis reads this way, Genesis 4.2. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord, and now you see why the Lord didn't accept Cain's offering, an offering of the fruit of the ground. Nothing wrong with that. But it was, the, it was the one that he brought. It was the type of thing he brought. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. Firstborn. Underline that in your Bible. And their fat portions, which was the very best. And we like the ribeye and the filet mignon, but theirs was the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now, what is that saying to us? Number one is saying offerings matter. They matter. And if you bring one that's by faith, that faith will be accepted to God. But if you bring an offering that is not based upon faith, in other words, if it's not based upon love for God, or it's, or it's based on fear. I'm going to give out of fear. You, don't, you never do that. But the offering that Abel bought, first of all, we notice something about it. That in the first offering is mentioned the first murder. Isn't it interesting that Satan hates the offering. And that he murdered the man who gave the offering of faith. And let me tell you, the devil does not like you to give offerings to the Lord. Come on, say Amen. Because it demonstrates your faith. It's an action that you are taking that is by faith. And then you notice that Abel did not bring the last little old runt sheep out there that had missing his back leg. He, he looked out over his flock before he gave his offering. He didn't say, now, you know what? I could give that old thing and that, that, that thing over there, and I don't need them anyway. You know, a lot of these offerings people receive, they, they just take any old thing, and if it's broke down, jerking around. That, but that's not, that does, that's not faith. Abel looked out, and, and, the, and you know which sheep he brought? He brought, somebody called him Fluffy. The very best. He was not only the firstborn and the best of strength, but he was the best sheep and he took Fluffy to that offering and he brought Fluffy to the Lord and he took his life and took his blood and he carefully put that on the altar. By the way, they believe that altar was right outside the gate where Adam and Eve were put out and the, and the swords crossed and the swords of flame and they, that's where they met with God. So he brought that, brought that blood offering uh, with his faith. But then Cain stopped by his vegetable garden, jerked out a few radishes and carrots, and brought them and threw them up on the altar, and that was it. Now you're seeing that there was no faith in his offering. And offerings do matter. And Abel gave the very best in faith. You can see a person's faith in their offering. And let me explain that to you. I've noticed people who really believe that God exists and that he's watching and that offerings matter to him. They do. Because when Abel offered his offering, the fire came from heaven and whoosh 
took that offering saying, I'm pleased. But those old carrots and vegetables and onions, they just laid up there. Nothing ever happened from heaven. You say, well, anything I give to God, he's going to receive. Not necessarily. It's got to be the first. And we know the first of the flock is the tithe. The tithe is the Lord's. So I do that. I've been doing that all this year. Tithing, tithing, and getting more and more blessed. How many of you are blessed by tithing? Come on. But then there's an offering that also I'm preparing for next Sunday, and it's a faith offering. I'm thinking about it already. I'm asking the Lord what he would have me do, and it's going to be something of faith. Now, the world will always tell you you're plum crazy to give your money to God. Plum crazy. That anything you give, man, it's like dropping it down a hole, and it's gone forever. But see, that's not the case with people of faith. Because I see beyond this world, and I see a God that is superintending my life. And as BJ said, he cares for me. He's watching over me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. He dresses the lilies. He cares for all of the fish of the sea. And let me tell you, he cares for L-A-R-R-Y. He cares for me. Hallelujah. And he cares for you. So when I bring my offering, I'm not dropping it down a hole somewhere. I'm handing it to the God of the universe who created me and the planets and everything. And I'm saying, I brought my very best. And I love you, Father. And nobody made me do this. I'm, li I'm giving this by faith. And I receive your blessing. Come on, give the Lord a shout if you believe it. So we coming in here next weekend, don't you bring up some little old vegetables and some little old corn. You, you pray about it. See, we never ask people to give. Never. We give them opportunities to give. It's, it's your opportunity. It's my opportunity. I remember I was in Mexico. And some of you have heard this statement, but I was, I was in preaching in a church down there. And a couple got up and they were, uh, they were giving their testimony. And it was a, a lady who was a prostitute had gotten saved, and she'd married this, this pastor from Puerto Rico after she'd given her heart to Christ. And while she was talking, I thought, man, that is very cool. This, this lady used to be a prostitute. God saved her, delivered her, and here she is up here testifying. Well, instantly an impression came to my mind of an amount of money that I should give that couple for a car. Now, out of nowhere, because, and the first thing I said is, I rebuke you, devil, in Jesus' name. But I figured something out. The devil has never told me anything good to do for somebody. So I had to cross that one off. And then I thought, well, Melanie's not down here in Mexico with me. I was in Monterey. And, and you know, I can't give that large amount unless I talk to her. You know, I'm the head, but she's the neck that turns the head. Y'all know what I mean. So, I, the, and when I said that, the Lord said, I didn't tell you to ask Melanie. I want you to give them that money for a car. And it was a lot. So I got through all my excuses. I made out my little check, and I got it in an envelope. After the service, I walked up to him, and I, here I had me a third little plan. I asked him, I said, through an interpreter, I said, do y'all need a car? I was hoping they'd say, no, no. <laughs> and they both dropped their eyes and started crying. They said, we need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get up in the mountains in Puerto Rico. That's where all our churches are. I said, have you found one? They said, we have. I said, well, look, I don't have the whole amount, but I got the start of the car fund, and I put it in her hand, and I laid hands on it. Well, I didn't think any more about it. I got home, told Melanie what I had done. She was happy about that. I had to go get a tooth fixed the day I got back because I lost a crown in Mexico. I'm crowned with many crowns. Y'all know that kind of I get there, and they're coming back. Rather, I got, I got to the dentist's office. He walks in as he's preparing it. He said, now, this was $500, but he said, I just checked your insurance, and it's only going to be $250. It was right about this time of year in 2012 when this happened. And I said, oh, wow. He said, Merry Christmas. So it saved me $250. I didn't even know I had that on my insurance. And I'm driving home, and I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, you pleased me in Mexico. 
He said, I'm going to open the windows of heaven upon you and pour out a blessing like you've never seen. Last week in November 2012, 40 days later, Melanie and I had two, rather two months later, in December and January, the end of January, Melanie and I had received 40 times the amount I gave to that couple. And wait a minute, it didn't stop there. It went all the next year. People gave everywhere I went. And that don't ever happen to me like that. It was the largest financial year I had ever had in 2013. And I trained about 3,500 pastors that year. I traveled all over America tra training pastors in the remnant book. But I, let me tell you something. I go around looking now for a place God wants me to give. Because I'm doing it by faith. I said, I'm doing it by faith. And whatever the Lord tells you to do, he may tell you to bless a widow. Well, he's got his eyes on widows. I know that. And he may tell you that widow right over there, I want you to go bless that person. And I'm doing it now all the time. Waitresses and people, I'm just sowing that seed and I'm doing it by faith. I ain't putting it down a hole somewhere. I'm handing it over into the spiritual world and it's good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Oh, come on, let's get excited about it. Hallelujah. And you know, that's why the Lord made it free will. If you don't want to do anything, it really shows a heart problem. That, that's the way he looks at it. And never be ashamed of a small seed. And listen, anything beats nothing every time. Did you know that? So it's acceptable if you offer it by faith. Now, let me go to number two. It says Enoch. First, that was Abel. Right off the bat, he says faith is the conviction of stuff that you can't see now. And he says Abel offered. Okay. So my giving actually shows how much I believe what I talk about. It shows, it's a demonstration of my faith. Then comes Enoch. What does that mean? Enoch walked with God. I'm reading from Genesis now. Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God, okay, and he was not. Boop. He was gone. He gone. That was, hey, the man is out having a prayer time. And God said to him, hey, man, I think it's closer to my house than yours. Why don't you come on home with me? He was not. For God, what does it say God did? He just took him. The man didn't die. He was translated. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Enoch was translated. Wouldn't that be a wonderful way to die is just not die? And you just... Now, now, what does that verse mean? What is, how is that a demonstration of faith? It is always a demonstration of my faith when I walk with God and converse with Him in prayer. And that's why Hebrews eleven six 6 says these words. Watch it carefully. Hebrews eleven six 6. Without faith... It is impossible to please him for whoever would, and look at the next four words, draw near to God, that's prayer, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. If you don't believe God exists, you ain't ever going to pray. You think prayer is a waste of time. The devil will tell you that's just a waste of time. There's nobody listening to you. But if you know that God is real, he's the living God. He's the God that answered Daniel in the lion's den. Come on. He's the God that helped them cross the Red Sea. You know, must believe that he exists and, and that he rewards those who, and in the Greek it uses the word diligently, rewards those who diligently seek him out. And you ladies on Black Friday, y'all went up in Target and y'all diligently sought out. People were breaking the doors down. You have to keep from being trampled. People are going up in there trying to buy a microwave oven. And the thing is the same price it was a month ago. They're just telling you it's Black Friday. And you acting like you're plum crazy. 
and you're diligent about it and you run from store to store and you're jumping over cars and let me tell you something. If you'd get as diligent about seeking God, he'd give you the money to buy the whole store. That's right. Enoch diligently sought God. You say, well, I thought you were going to be preaching about faith. I didn't know you were going to get off in this prayer thing. I'm talking about prep faith right now. I'm talking about how you live by faith is to get yourself up out of the bed every morning. Angels don't carry you from the bed to your living room. Get up, brush your teeth, go in there and get with God and say, good morning, Father. Ooh, I love you, Lord. And begin to sing a psalm to him and praise. What is that? That's faith. That is faith. And Enoch so got, it, the man lived 365 years, so maybe at least 300 years every day, every day, he walked with God. He walked with God. Can I challenge you in 2022? Not only do you change your giving to say, Lord, I'm handing it to you. I believe in you. I'm giving my offerings by faith. But I'm also praying every day. I'm seeking after you diligently, Lord. I'm running after you. I'm going after you. Come on, lift up your hands right now. I just sense in this room, close your eyes, and faith is seeing things that do not exist in the natural world. But I want you to see heaven's throne and the angels all around it, and God the Father's beckoning you to come close to his throne. And he says, talk to me. I love you. Talk to me. Hear my, to praise me. Worship me. And I will bless you. I thank you, Lord, 2022, everyone in our church is going to draw close to God. You are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you let us live by faith father we thank you for it in Jesus name everybody said amen. amen all right let's come to number three by faith Abraham obeyed see we got that uh, Abel offered we got that Enoch walked up and down with God but Abraham obeyed Every one of them, go through Hebrews 11. The series isn't finished today, but go ahead and read Hebrews 11. Every one of them is a miracle that happened because of an act. Faith is an act. Faith is demonstrated. And in this way, God said to Abraham, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called. When he was called. Everybody in here and all of our campuses, you have a calling. Amen. You have a purpose. You have a mission. I've been in mine now 52 years preaching the gospel. I don't have to wonder. I know what my calling is till the Lord takes me home. I know it's a calling to change the world. And Abraham was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he lived way over there in what we know now as southern Iraq. And that's a long way from the Holy Land. Thousands of miles. He didn't know anybody in the Holy Land. He'd never been to the Holy Land, to Israel. It wasn't even called Israel in those days. He would be named after his own kids. But he, the Lord got him up one day and said, hey, man, I'm telling you, I'm going to take you to a place. He says, yeah, Lord. Well, where is that? He said, I ain't going to tell you till you get there. I'll tell you when you're there. Can you imagine him trying to convince Sarah to pack up their stuff? Because she said, where are we going? He said, I don't know. I've been called to go find a place. It's a city whose builder and maker is God. And he went out, look at it, not knowing where he was a-going. Now think about it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Abraham went out. But you got to look and think of you. He sold his business. He had to sell his house. He had to get rid of, had to have a junk sale, a yard sale. He had to do every, all of that stuff. And his wife said, where are we going? I don't know, love. God just called me and told me to go somewhere and I'm following him. Now, I'm not telling you to go sell everything, move to India. I ain't telling you to do that. But what I'm saying is God has a calling upon your life. He has a mission for you and me to accomplish. And his happened to be 
to bring the Messiah into the world. To bless the entire world. He said, through your seed, as Jesus, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. But he can't do it there in the land of Babylon. In idolatry. I got to get you in a fresh spot of ground. And it says he went out not knowing where he is going. Obedience in faith is when you step out not knowing everything about the end. All you know is the first step. The second step. But you cannot see the end yet. You don't have to know all the details of the end to obey in the beginning. Please hear that. Because Jesus said, hey, I'm gonna, let's give these people something to eat. And, of course, Philip comes up and says it would take a year's salary to feed all these people one bite. And Jesus said, thank you, Philip, for that information. And Andrew says, well, look, I got a little boy here. He's got five biscuits and two sardines. Is that enough to get started? That's just a first step. But when you put the first step in the hands of God, it's multiplied a million times over. Until you get out of your comfort zone and hear God speaking to you in your prayer time and then just start. Start walking by faith. And what about the day that he told him to sacrifice his beautiful new baby to the Lord, his new son, probably 15, 16 years old. And he rose early the next morning and obeyed. And even brought him and bound him and raised the knife. And God stopped him and said, now I know. Now I know that you trust me. It says in Hebrews that Abraham believed that if he would have killed his son, God would have raised him from the dead right there on the altar. Because through him would come the Messiah. I don't know who the Lord is speaking to today about your mission next year. Your calling. Your direction. Oh, you say it's dark right now, Brother Larry. I don't know what, I, I, it's so dark. I know it. It's 3.30 in the morning. There's no cars on the road. It sure don't look like a new day. But God has got a new day for you. Amen. God's got a calling for you. God's got a purpose for you. I feel this is so strong right now. God has it all figured out. You just don't try to figure everything out before you ever put your toe in the Jordan River. The moment they put their toe in the Jordan, it stopped 20 miles up. You could not see that it had started to stop. The river was still flooded. But when they put their foot in the Jordan, the miracle started. And then hours later, the water started receding where they were. It's time for you to step out and do what God has called you to do. Come on, say amen. amen. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. 